Hi, my name is Rick Henderson. I'm the lead pastor here at Autumn Ridge Church. Thank you for checking out some of our messages here on our YouTube page. You've clicked on a message that's incredibly important to me. This series is the very first series I gave as pastor here at Autumn Ridge Church, and it just happened to coincide uh, with the launch of COVID. So it's at least historically important to me and a little bit important to our church. As I was trying to help our people get to uh, know me a little bit, one of the ways to do that is to help them understand some of the men who've influenced me. One of those guys is Tim Keller. As a matter of fact, I have no idea where my thoughts end and his thoughts uh, began. And if over the course of uh, your, your time watching videos or even attending Autumn Ridge Church, if you hear me say something that's helpful, it's very likely because another pastor said something like that to me and I wanted to pass it on to you. This series that you're watching is largely influenced and inspired by Tim Keller's book and lecture series of the same name, Encounters with Jesus. So if there's anything in, in this message that you find yourself appreciating, I wanna encourage you, go get Tim Keller's book, read it. I think that uh, you'll find even more encouragement and rich information for you. Again, thanks for watching. Good morning, Autumn Ridge Church family. My name is Rick Henderson. I'm excited uh, to speak to you for the first time as your new uh, senior pastor. Uh, I want to welcome all of those who are watching from around and beyond. Uh, this is the Sunday that was supposed to celebrate, hey, I, I'm getting started, and this was supposed to be the installation service, but you're at home, and you're kept away from me, and I'm here, and I'm kept away from you. Let's just call this the incarceration service. Uh, you won't hurt my feelings. We can laugh together as we talk about that. Uh, we're probably asking ourselves, what's coming next? Uh, a few weeks ago, when I spoke for the first time during the candidating weekend, uh, there was a big blizzard. Many of you couldn't be here. Now there's a global pandemic. What's coming next? Are are the Vikings going to win the Super Bowl? Uh, let's don't get carried away. Um, <laughs> seriously, let me just say to you, you have done a phenomenal job, and I'm going to speak on behalf of, of my wife and my, my kids as well, of making us feel welcome and love in this church and in this community. You've bombarded us with food and with flowers, uh, with coffee and coffee mugs, part of my love language. I appreciate that so much. I didn't notice no one dropped any toilet paper off at my house. I guess some resources are just too precious to share uh, right now. Today, I'm excited to begin a new season of ministry, um, and we're going to kick off as well a brand new message series that's called Encounters with Jesus. If you are new to Christianity, if you're new to the Bible, you're, you're not really sure about the, the New Testament, I think as we look at different uh, scenes from Jesus's life, different encounters he had with real historical people, that you're going to find surprising insight and encouragement that's relevant to you. For those of you who you've been a longtime follower of Jesus, you've, you've read the New Testament, you know what it says. Uh, you're, you're not going to find new things. The same old stuff is there, but I think that you're going to see that the insight and the encouragement for you goes deeper than maybe you once thought possible. As we look at Jesus and his real encounters with different people, we're gonna see bubbling up to the surface some common questions that are incredibly relevant for us today. And what we might find is that there are unexpected answers to our common and pressing questions. I love how one pastor phrased it. He said, Jesus didn't come to tell us the answers to the questions of life. He came to be the answer. Now, this is a season right now where we have a lot of questions, maybe some new questions. And wouldn't it be nice if there was like a philosophical Google or, or a spiritual or moral Google that would just rapidly and instantly give us the answers that we need to our most important pressing questions. I don't know about you. I don't know what questions you're asking, but I think we're all kind of gripped by, by a few of the same questions as we're watching leaders in our country and in our state and around the world figure out how to navigate this. A lot of us are asking, which do we really value more, giving out blame or taking responsibility? We live in a culture, we live in a time where it's normal for people to define themselves, to find their identity by looking deep into themselves. But as we look at a run on resources and people hoarding supplies and we walk into stores and we see empty shelves, we can't help but ask this question as well. What does it really mean to be a member of, to be a part of a community? Here's something that uh, I'll just admit to you I've had to wrestle with myself. During college and professional uh, sports being canceled, which do I really deep down value more? My entertainment or what's in the best interests of other people? When we have big questions, big questions always expose and reveal our deep 
beliefs. And we only have one of two ways to go. Either when we're asking these really big, important questions, we get to make up our own facts, we're gonna make up our own truth, we're just gonna go with opinions, or, or it's our responsibility to push past opinions, push past preferences. It's our responsibility to discover what the truth really is. And when we ask really important questions, the deep down most important questions that unite us, even if we're divided over the answers, we're united by the same questions. One of the things that these questions do is it kind of, it, it touches on that we have this sense that we are valuable, that, that, that we're worth something. We have purpose in life. And as you think about that, I want to share with you something that, that I read from a pastor who I admire. His name is Tim, Tim Keller. He tweeted this out some time ago. He said, if you come from insignificance and when you die, you return to insignificance, then nothing is significant now. Well, that's kind of a gut punch. That's uncomfortable. And and maybe you don't like hearing that. And so this is what I did. When I came across that, I shared that with some of my friends who would describe themselves as atheists, my friends who would describe themselves as agnostic, or just friends who, unlike me, they're not convinced of the truthfulness of Christianity. And so I said, what do you think about this? And I'm gonna give you an, ad, an aggregate of some of their responses. They would say things like, my life is significant because it's the only one I have. Uh, it's significant to me because of the people who care about me. Uh, their lives are significant to me because I care about them. And, and then they all essentially said this, there may not be an ultimate truth out there. There may not be a God out there, but that doesn't change the fact that my life is personally meaningful. And even though that doesn't share my viewpoint, there's something about that that resonates with me emotionally. There's something touching there, isn't it? When you look into the eyes of a loved one and you tell them how valuable they are and they look back at you and they tell you how valuable you are, that, that there's, there's power there. How many of us can say our egos were boosted, our sense of self-worth just kind of skyrocketed when there's someone who we admired and they affirmed us and they put their affection on us. That feels good. But if that's all there is to it, there are a couple of big questions. There are some big hurdles. I just don't know how to get past. And let me share them with you. Here's one. If that's true, if it's simply it, we, we're meaningful because we think we are and because someone tells us we are because they like us, because they love us, then doesn't that mean that there's no ultimate basis for human rights and dignity? There's no ultimate basis for saying sexism is wrong and racism is wrong and all kinds of discrimination are wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. You can still treat people well, and I hope you do, but there's no ultimate basis to say that those things are wrong. It's bothered me. It's broken my heart to hear about instances around our country and even in our own community where people of Chinese descent have been mistreated in the context of the coronavirus, where they've been the recipients of racism. I think that's intolerable. I think that's wrong. And if you agree with me, if you'd say, Rick, that's wrong, that shouldn't happen. Is it wrong simply because it's our opinion? Or is it truly wrong? But there's another hurdle I can't get past. Every person I've ever talked to agrees with what I'm about to say next, which is an incredibly rare thing. But everyone agrees with this. Just because I believe it doesn't make it true. Don't teach that to our kids. Just because I believe it doesn't make it true. And yet, countless people have turned around and told me, my life is meaningful because I believe that it is. Well, do you believe it because it's true? Or is it true because you believe it. I may believe that Jim Gaffigan is the funniest man alive, and I can't wait to see him when he comes to town in September. I, I think he's incredibly funny. You may disagree with me. You don't have a sense of humor. That's okay. But you could say back to Rick, to me, Rick, that's a matter of taste. That's a matter of opinion. And you know what? You're right. But human dignity, human worth, your value, is that a matter of taste? Is that a matter of of opinion for human rights and dignity and your worth to be real and true. I mean, don't we know deep down that it has to be based on something a little bit more sturdy than opinion? When Jesus rose from the dead, the message of the gospel, which just means good news, the good news of his message spread around the known world like wildfire. And there are some incredible promises, like you can be forgiven of your sin. Your guilt can be solved. That you are made in the image of God who loves you and wants to know you. That there is encouragement and there is guidance for your life. And all of that was validated. All the things he taught, all the things he said, all the things he did, they were validated and proved true by the fact that he got up out of the dead. And there was a guy who knew him, maybe Jesus' closest friend, a man named John. John wrote a biography of Jesus's life. He was an eyewitness to all the things that happened in Jesus's life, all the important things. He was there on the front row listening to what Jesus had to say. He was an eyewitness to the resurrection. 
And so John wrote this biography of Jesus's life. If you are a church person, you know it as the gospel of John. And in it, we find profound things about the life of Jesus. But one of the first things we see is this. And even if you're home and you're not here, I would love for you to write this down. Life isn't just personally meaningful. It's meaningful because of a person. And I want to share with you the very first line of John's biography of Jesus's life. John 1.1. In the beginning, the word already existed. He was with God and he was God. Now, that word that John used to describe Jesus is an incredibly important word. You know this, English didn't exist yet. He wrote this down in the most common language of the day, that was Greek. And what we read as, in the beginning was the word, that term there, word, it comes from the Greek word logos. That is a big word. It's a spectacular word. It's like a bucket, and it carries all of these important things. And Greek people wrestled over this. Philosophers wrestled over exactly what logos was, and they were looking for it. And when they used that word, this is what they meant, that logos, it represented logic and values and human purpose and the source of life and the significance of life. And when John, that opening line of his biography of Jesus's life, he was making a profound statement. It was essentially this, in the beginning, the meaning of life already existed. The meaning of life was with God. The meaning of life was God. Jesus Christ is the meaning of life. And that means your life isn't just personally meaningful, it's meaningful because of Jesus, because you were made in his image. He knows you, he loves you. He wants a relationship with you. And that means that even though science may be involved, you're not simply the product of really cool science. You are uniquely created by God. That your life and my life, it's not defined and guided by abstract principles, but at the root of it all is the person of Jesus Christ. Now, immediately after making that clear, John jumps into uh, letting us see how some encounters played out between Jesus and other people. What you have to know is during this time, one of the common, everybody was gripped by kind of a common question. It was a combination of politics and religion. And they were wondering, is God ever going to send us a savior? Is God ever going to send us a Messiah who's going to kick out our Roman oppressors? Politically, life is not good. It's not great having these, this military presence hold us back and hold us down. Is God going to do something about it? Some people were confident. Yes, I know he's going to do it. Some people were skeptical. Some people maybe were just hoping and wishing that it would be true. Now, at this point, there are, there, we're going to look at some college-age guys who meet Jesus for the first time. And, and they were students. They were following kind of an edgy, fascinating, awesome a uh, rabbi teacher, a guy named John the Baptist, a different John than the one who wrote this biography of Jesus's life. One of the guys who was a student of John the Baptist was Philip. This is what happens. John chapter one, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip had been following John. Now he's gonna follow Jesus. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What you gotta see is basically Philip is announcing to his friend Nathanael, this is the guy, this is the one we've been hoping and wondering, is God gonna send someone? We found him. Nathanael though, he's not buying it. He's skeptical. He says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Philip just responded, come and see. Come check it out for yourself. And when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And this is odd, and I don't know exactly yet why this is so meaningful, but we'll jump into it. Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus said, you believe because I saw you under a fig tree? You're going to see greater things than that. And then he added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. There's a lot here to jump into, and we're going to dive into a lot of it. But here's the first thing that I want you to see, and it's this. Nathaniel ended up meeting Jesus, uh, learning about Jesus, and ultimately following Jesus because his friend invited them. And that's what good friends do. They share things that they think are good. Maybe if you're a note taker, you could write this down. People share what they love with whom they love. 
This probably explains why my wife is always trying to share broccoli with me. I'd wish she stopped, but I think it's because she loves me and wants me to be healthy. Now, some of you might be watching this message live, but maybe you're not watching it live. Maybe you're watching it days later, weeks later. And the reason you're watching is because a friend shared it with you. And they shared it with you because you are meaningful to them. You're a meaningful person in their life. And your friend found something meaningful in this experience. And because they love you, they simply wanted you to know about it too. That's what friends do. Even though we're in a series of so, a, a, a season of social distancing, it doesn't mean that sharing has to stop. If you're healthy and it would be prudent for you and wise and loving for you, you could invite people into your home to participate with you in the live stream. I think they're going to cancel school in the next couple of days. Your kids, I'm sure, would be excited to do some extra chores, make sure the house is clean. You could cook up some some food and, and you can invite your friends over and you can make your home or your apartment, your living room, an outpost of hope during this season of change and uncertainty. If you would say, Rick, I'd love to do that, but I'm in the high-risk category, maybe it's just not wise for you to invite people over, or maybe it wouldn't be wise for you to accept an invitation, you can share too. You could start a watch party on Facebook. There's ways for you to engage from a distance, to share from a distance. I want to encourage you to do that. But let me say to all of those, to those of you watching, and you're like me, you're a follower of Jesus. That somewhere in your past, you decided that you were going to trust and follow the good news of the gospel. The reason that you're a follower of Jesus is the exact same reason I'm a follower of Jesus. Somewhere in our story, somebody thought Jesus was worth talking about and you were worth talking to. People share what they love with whom they love. Let's jump back into this interplay between these two friends, Philip and Nathaniel. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And just like dripping with teenage sarcasm and snark, Nathaniel responds, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Obviously, Nathaniel is a bit of a snob here. We can't be mad at him. Basically, everybody from Jerusalem looked down on Nazareth. It'd be like... Uh, a Vikings fan saying, Green Bay, can anything good come out of Green Bay? All right. If you're not a sports person, it'd be like this. Transitioning to somebody from Nazareth would be like a student at Harvard leaving Harvard to go study at a community college. It's just not done. And Philip responded, come and see. Come check it out. I want to be clear about something. Philip believed first. Because he believed and followed Jesus first, that doesn't make him a better guy. Nathaniel responded with doubt and skepticism because he responded with doubt first. That doesn't make him a bad guy. I don't, I don't know if it would be surprising to hear this from, from a pastor, but skepticism isn't necessarily a bad thing. It could be a healthy thing. Maybe you would write this down. Skepticism, it can keep you from moving down the wrong path. It just won't move you down the right one. It'll keep you from moving down the wrong one. It just won't move you down the right one. It's kind of like brakes on a car. It's necessary but it's just not going to get you going in the way that you need to and the way that you want to. Skepticism is a healthy thing. It's a sign that your mind is turned on. It's a sign that you're thinking. It's, hey, I know this is true, and you're telling me this is true, and I don't know how to reconcile these two things yet. That is a good thing. That's a healthy thing. That's honoring God with your mind. And yet, it can become an unhealthy thing when it mutates into what we call dismissiveness. If skepticism says, and, and, this is, and, and this is Nathaniel, he was more than just a skeptic. He was really dismissive. If skepticism says, that doesn't sound right. Dismissiveness says, I'm not even going to listen. Think about dismissiveness this way. Maybe you would write this down as well. Dismissiveness is immediate skepticism with an attitude. It's saying, this isn't even worth considering. I'm not going to listen to you. There's no possible way you could have anything that would be helpful to me. I already know everything I need to know or want to know about this. Now, here's a problem with dismissiveness. It robs us of something really important. It robs us of our ability to see our own blind spots, and we have them. It robs us of our ability to see our own cognitive dissonance. It robs us of our ability to see our own hypocrisy. Dismissiveness is something that any person from any background, any belief system can be vulnerable to. Let me say something to you guys. If you're a Christian, if you're like me, you've become convinced of the truth of the gospel. Your life has been made new by Jesus. You have something worth sharing. But what we don't have is a license to be dismissive 
I have no idea why anyone would ever want to listen to me if I didn't seriously consider them in return. I want to share with you things you probably already know, but this is, these are the behaviors of dismissive people. This is the kind of thing Jesus would never endorse. This is the kind of thing that love would reject. Dismissive people, it's eye rolls and sighs. That's not good. They listen with the intent to reply. They don't listen with the intent to understand. Dismissive behavior is rarely asking questions. Dismissive behavior is this. It's misquoting, misunderstanding, almost on purpose because you hear only what you want to hear. I don't want to be that way. Now, I've got some friends. They don't agree with me. I wouldn't call them dismissive. They just they don't see things the way that I see things. They wouldn't describe themselves as Christians. They're not yet convinced of the, of the historical reality of the resurrection. They're not yet convinced of the truth of Christianity. And they would say to me, and many of them have, Rick, I don't have to believe in God to be a good person. And I say, you're right, you don't. You might even be a better person than me. But Think about this for a second. If you value things like tolerance and human rights and dignity and forgiving enemies and honoring the poor, caring for immigrants and the oppressed, caring for people who are ill, which we're trying to do, did you know that all of those values come from Christianity? Those values didn't become common until Christianity was commonly embraced. And if you're a skeptic right now, you're thinking, hold on, buddy, Uh, you're a pastor, you're supposed to say those kinds of things, and you're probably right. I am supposed to say that. But what about if someone who is a self-avowed atheist said the exact same thing? Wouldn't that be interesting? I want to share with you an article, or part of an article, from the American Thinker, and it's written by John Steinrucken. And listen to what he says. The article is entitled, Secularism's Ongoing Debt to Christianity. Although I'm a secularist, an atheist, if you will, I accept that the great majority of people would be morally and spiritually lost without religion. Can anyone seriously argue that crime and debauchery are not held in check by religion? Is it not comforting to live in a community where the rule of law and fairness are respected? Would such be likely if Christianity were not there to provide a moral compass to the great majority? Do we secularists not benefit out of all proportion from a morally responsible society? Succinctly put, Western civilization's survival including the survival of open secular thought depends on the continuance within our society of the Judeo-Christian tradition. I would love to have a cup of coffee uh, with this man. And I would tell him, this is an incredible article. I'd love to hear more about what led you to write this. But here's a question that I would ask. If the values that make the most sense to you cannot make sense of your own worldview, why does it continue to get your allegiance? Let's turn back now to this interplay between Philip and Nathaniel. I love, man, I just absolutely love, I want to be this kind of guy. I love how Philip responded to Nathaniel. When Nathaniel is grumpy and snarky and dismissive and a tad insulting, Philip doesn't respond with the kind of behavior that's so common to see in Facebook comments. He just maintains his, friendly, his friendliness and says, come and see come check it out. It's as if he's embraced this attitude. It's not my responsibility to convince you. It's my responsibility to share with you the things that convinced me. And so you know what Nathaniel did? He did what friends do. He accepted the invitation, even though he didn't believe yet, even though he was probably just as snarky and skeptical every step along the way, he went and checked it out because his friend invited him to. And when he did, he discovered something. He discovered something that many of you have experienced. He's discovered something that some of us know all too well, and it's this. The truth knows us before we know it. Hang in here with me, and you'll see what I'm talking about. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael declared, Rabbi, You are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You're going to see greater things than that. When he asked the question, how do you know me? That means Jesus pegged him. Jesus understood him. They had had absolutely zero encounters before. They had never met before. They didn't know each other. And yet Jesus could speak to him in a way that exposed him, that that cut right to the core of who he was. And we've experienced that, some of us, before. It's a defenseless feeling when our thoughts, when our attitudes, when our motives, when they're laid bare to the insights and the explanations of someone else. 
And this isn't something that's confined to face-to-face encounters with Jesus. This is something that's experienced whenever we read the gospel. It's something peculiar and powerful about the truth of the gospel. It exposes us. It explains us. It reveals God to us, and it explains us to ourselves. It explains the phenomenon of sitting in a crowd or watching from a distance and hearing a man or woman talk about the gospel, and it feels like they know you, like they hacked into your email, like they've been spying on you. It's the feeling that my heart, my mind has been hacked. That's what truth does. It knows us before we know it. And this is explained in the New Testament. We should expect this. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. One of my heroes of the faith is a man, he was far from perfect, He was an example of courage during the rise of of Hitler and what it meant to follow Jesus and encourage other people to do so. It was a man named Karl Barth. This is what he said about this phenomenon. I have read many books, but the Bible reads me. And in this moment, Nathaniel is realizing that's what's going on. This guy knows something about me that no one else could know. It defies explanation. And I don't know about you, but I'm wondering, dude, what is going on under the fig tree that Jesus knowing about that grabs your attention in your heart like this? I wish I knew what it was. I'd love to know what your opinions are. We just can't know. But we do know this. It was so profound that Nathaniel, in an instant, in a flash, he went from dismissive to devoted. And when he does that, it's almost like Jesus pumps the brakes. Wait a second, you're believing in me because of such a small thing? Jesus is basically questioning his proclamation, his his allegiance. And here's my question, maybe it's your question. Why would Jesus question Nathanael for proclaiming his belief? I think the answer is this. It's not that Nathanael's belief was wrong. His belief was premature. It's as if Jesus is saying, yes, believe. I want you to know me. I want you to believe in me, but not too soon. And there's a reason for that. If dismissiveness is dangerous because it it rejects the truth without good reasons, premature belief is dangerous because it accepts the truth without good reasons. Now, there's some danger in that. Let me share with you three reasons why I think that that's something we should avoid. Number one, immature belief or premature belief, it relies on emotion not on information. And when the emotion changes, it's replaced by a more powerful thought or, or feeling, our life is redirected. Secondly, it trusts the right thing, trust the right thing, but for the wrong reasons. Parents, this is important. College students, this is important. I think this explains why so many college students are tempted to or actually reject the faith that their parents tried to pass on to them. It's you embrace the right thing, but you didn't really know why. You didn't know why you should do it. You just did it because it was part of your family identity. And when things changed and when adversity came and when you were challenged, you didn't know why to continue to hold that. You are so incredibly valuable. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself to know why you believe what you believe. Here's the third reason why premature belief or immature belief is a scary thing. It thinks it's found the end when it's really only found the beginning. And when we get to the end of something, we kind of give up. But when we realize that we're at the starting line, it puts some responsibility on us. We have steps to take with it. Now, it's very likely that when Nathaniel met Jesus, he thought to himself, he, well, actually, it's very likely that he believed far too much and far too little about Jesus at the exact same time. It's very likely that he thought, here's a guy who's going to be my savior from my Roman oppressors, but he didn't think of Jesus as the one to save him from his sin and his moral guilt. It's very likely that when he first met Jesus, he thought, here's a man who is, an, who is extraordinary, but he didn't yet think of him as the ultimate authority for life. It's very likely that when Nathaniel met Jesus, he thought, oh my goodness, here's somebody I can get amazing things from. But he didn't yet think of Jesus as Here's the one that I was designed to get. He is the source. He's the foundation. He's the meaning of life. And I I think Jesus' response is essentially this. Nathaniel, yes, trust in me, believe in me, but I want you to know who's the one that you're actually placing your trust in. And I think this is something that many of us can relate to. Maybe you are considering following Jesus for the first time. Maybe you're considering again following Jesus for the first time in a long time. Or, or maybe you feel this pressure right now. You want to up your devotion and, and, and your allegiance to Jesus. And, and it's really fueled by this. If I follow Jesus, am I going to be safe? 
If I follow Jesus, is he going to make me well? Is he going to make sure that I'm protected from the, from the coronavirus? And Jesus' response to Nathaniel is really the essential, his, his same response to us. That's not what the invitation to the gospel is about. The invitation to know Jesus is about knowing him and enjoying him. It's about changing our status from sinner and offender to friend of God. It's not about changing our circumstances. It's about reorienting our minds and our hearts to know the truth. And just to let you know what you're getting into if you follow Jesus, and I hope that you do, it probably raises your your risk of infection instead of lessening it. Throughout history, Christians have been compelled to run to danger, to run to the fire, to run to the sick, to the hurting, to the dying, to the infected, to bring care to them when everyone else was running in the opposite direction. And when you hear me say that, you might be asking yourself this, well, then why in the world are we sequestered? Why aren't we meeting together? Why are we avoiding nursing homes? Why are we doing all this social distancing stuff? Well, to answer that good question, let's dip back into history. Let's look at another hero of the faith, I want us to see what Martin Luther wrote to another pastor when Europe was gripped by the plague. And it was written around 500 years ago, so it might sound a little clunky. Hang with me. He wrote this. I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order to not become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me and I have done what he has expected of me and so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but I will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. Here it is. If me getting closer to you because I love you and I care about you, if that brings risk to you, I'm gonna stay away. But if you have needs, if you have real needs that I can meet and there's no one else to meet them because I love you and I move closer to you in that moment and it brings risk to me, I can't stay away. And you might be wondering, how in the world do we navigate these choices, these decisions with both wisdom and with love? Let me tell you what I and the other pastors are doing, what the elders of this church are doing, what I hope that we would all do, is we're taking seriously the recommendation of our government leaders and authority. We're taking seriously what we're told by those in the medical community. And we take seriously the authority, the commands, and the example of Jesus Christ. So let's end our time together by looking again one one more time very quickly at Philip's challenge, his invitation to his friend. Come and see. And this is going to be our bottom line. This is the thing I want you to take with you. Come and see. And I think that means we do at least two things. Number one, we stop and we think. We reconsider the things going going on around us. We re-examine the things going on in us and we reevaluate them and we think about them in light of who Jesus is and the things that he's said. Secondly, we shouldn't do this alone. This is something to process with friends. This is a time of disruption. None of us would have ever chosen this. What's going on, it's not a good thing and yet there is an advantage in it. And the advantage is, is this, it causes us to look at everything in a new light. The things we once took for granted, we look at again. The things that we thought were certain and we're realizing these things are not certain, we get to look at them again through the life and the teaching of Jesus. For those of you who are already followers of Jesus, you know him, you trust him, you follow him, I think that you're gonna discover throughout this series that there is greater encouragement, that there's greater insight, there's greater confidence found in a relationship with Jesus than you ever thought possible. For those of you who are not yet followers of Jesus, or maybe you're leaning away and you still have unanswered questions, you need to get your questions answered. But if you would agree with an atheist thinker like John Steinrucken and you value human dignity and and you value and cherish a morally responsible society, you are already cherishing the values that come from Jesus. Since you agree with him on so much already, would you consider following him? This is my hope over the next several weeks is that you will continue to join us. Would you come 
and see. Pray with me.